your Bibles or if you just want to listen, we're going to look at two passages of Scripture this morning. The first is a part of our lectionary text found in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 43. We'll read two verses, verses 18 and 19. Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. And for those of you who are, you know, overachievers and you like to go ahead and skip ahead, the next passage is going to be Mark 5. Mark 5. Yes. <laughs> Isaiah 43, verse 18. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Mark chapter 5. So we'll be looking at the passage, verses 1 through 20 in its entirety, but we're not going to read all those verses right now. Amen. You go to verse 14, Mark chapter 5, verse 14. The swine herders ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demon act sitting there, clothed in his right mind. The very man who had had the legion, and they were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demon act and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the area of the capitalists and gatherings how much Jesus had done for him and everyone was made. Amen. Amen. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Can we say thanks to you, God? Thank you, God. God, we are so incredibly thankful that you speak to us and that you allow us to hear you, God. So we pray now that you open our ears, that we are able to hear and receive a word from you. God, that the power of your spirit may tap on our hearts in such a way that we are jolted to action, jolted to loving you more as a result of hearing your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Out of the old, in with the new. So if you were able to see this man, his hair was probably matted and dirty. His body was probably naked and very thin, skinny. His skin, a collage of many colors, spurned from dried and fresh blood, from having self-brutalized himself, hitting and beating himself violently. He lived and dwelled amongst the tombs because the people didn't know what to do with him. They didn't know how to handle him. His screams would shake the foundations of the tombs day in and night out. And so they chained him like a beast with the dead folk. But he kept breaking free because darkness is always drawn to the light. And the thirsty live for the chance to drink some water. Amen? Jesus and his disciples had just come through that unexpected storm on the Sea of Galilee, and they are approaching the, the shore of Gadarenes. And before Jesus can get out of the boat, he sees a semblance of his image running towards him. Immediately, Jesus says, come out of the man, unclean spirit. The man continues running. He falls before Jesus and he says, what have you to do with me, son of the most high God? I implore you, by God, do not torment me. Jesus looks down and he says, what's your name? He said, my name is Legion, for we are men. A Roman legion was comprised of anywhere between 3,000 and 6,000 soldiers. And there were about 2,000 swine grazing on a hill near the shore. And so the demons asked Jesus, they said, well, look, just don't cast us out. Can you just cast us into the swine? Jesus grants their petition, and the swine violently run down the hill into the sea, dead. 
Now, can you imagine the stunned silence of those witnessing this event? Can you imagine what in the world they're thinking, seeing this happen? As they look from the sea to Jesus and from Jesus to this man, and they begin to run back and tell folk, right? Word spreads fast. We know drama spreads fast, right? If we know you want something to spread, you better make sure it's drama for you. Amen? <laughs> so people, not just from the city, but folk from the country, they didn't just get to the city. They went to the country too. And so hordes of people begin to come to the shore to see what has happened. And when they get there, they find this man this man that they had changed like a beast in the tombs, sitting in his right mind. Jesus had clothed him and cleaned him up real nice. He was sitting in a blessed position at the feet of Jesus. They couldn't hear him screaming because he wasn't screaming. So they could actually hear the calm beating of the shore, the seashore, right? And they were afraid. Then some of them hear, some for a second time, the story as it happened. Yeah, man, it was like they knew each other, man. The, the guy got out of the boat, and before he could get out, good, crazy Jack just came running, and he came up to him, and then they started talking. He says, and as they were talking, he said, something came out of crazy Jack that I ain't never seen come out of nobody before in my life. And then before you know it, the pigs, they just ran into the sea and killed themselves. <laughs> oh, Jesus, is that your name? Kill my son. You gotta go. No, you're not welcome. You gotta go. Did you hear me? You are not welcome here. Please leave now. Jesus does not question. He does not even respond. He simply turns and begins to walk back towards the boat. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. You don't understand what he did for me. No, Jesus, hold on. Hold on. You can't leave me here with these people. <laughs> Y'all don't know what he did to me. He saved me, Jesus. Please, please, come on, come on. I, I, I want to go with you. <laughs> Jesus had granted the request of the demons to enter the swine. He had granted the request of the people to leave. And now he was saying no to his newest disciple. Mm -hmm. He says, no, I need you to stay. He says, no, I want you to go back into town, into all the region. I want you to tell all your friends what I did for you today. I want you to tell them how I had compassion and mercy on you. Amen. And so he does that and it says that all who heard marveled and were amazed. I mean, I would be amazed, right? Thinking about where he was and where God brought him to, they were amazed. Now, before we delve too deeply in, I need to pause for a minute and, and, and clarify some stuff, okay? It's important that I clarify because many times in the black church specifically, I have heard people use demon possession and mental illness synonymously, and they're not synonymous. Okay? Now, there are instances in which people have a mental illness that is not in any way connected to any demonic influence. Say that. All right? Or direct demonic influence. Okay? It is either physical, biological, and or circumstantial. Certain traumas in our life can bring forth certain illnesses in our minds, yes. all right? Now, that is not to say that there aren't instances in which there, is, there may be a spiritual influence where certain things are manifest, right? But Jesus deals with both illness and demon possession in the same way throughout the scriptures. They need healing, period. Amen. Right? Amen. Jesus healed people who were demon possessed, and he healed people whose bodies were sick. All right? So I just need to clarify that. And just as another note, you know, be generous with your time as I registered for it. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. But there are several strange things that are happening in this text today, and we can't delve into them all, but perhaps the most perplexing thing in this text today that is odd are these people's fear. Now, some of you are saying, well, God, we, we live with fear every day. What's so strange about fear? What's so strange about fear is that these people appear to fear Jesus because of the healing he performed. That is an odd thing based upon other healing stories. Most of the time, people 
are begging God to what? Stay after a healing. Not leave. So what was it? What was it that they felt was in danger? What was such the danger imposed, right? That they perceived, right? That made them want to push Jesus out rather than invite him in. Well, an obvious thing is probably fear of the unknown, right? We often fear what is unfamiliar to us. We fear what we can't understand or comprehend. Why? Because unfamiliar stuff, right? New stuff means that things are changing. And we don't like change. But no matter how many times we are told that we are resistant to change, it doesn't change the fact that we're resistant. Right? Uh-huh. <laughs> Jesus was brand new to these people. Right? They showed no indication that they knew who Jesus was. Right? All they know is that this man came and Jack is now calm. Right? That's my name for him. Don't go talking about Jack in, in the Bible because you're going to see it. <laughs> and their swine are dead, right? Jesus has done something completely new. This is one of the first accounts of Jesus actually encountering Gentiles. Who is a Gentile? A Gentile is someone who is non-Jewish, outside of the house of Israel, right? So these are people who are not connected with, with who Jesus would be, right? And their first encounter with him is so counter or opposite to what they are familiar with that they automatically reject it. And we're not that different. Amen. 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 So I would like to just say for the next few minutes, because we read a passage in Isaiah, I would like to propose to you that the promise that, G that God gives in Isaiah when he says that he will do a new thing uh -huh. is inherited by us. Right. But like the people in Gadarenes, sometimes there are some things in our life that causes us to push God out rather than invite him. Right? And so there are, very, there are two very quick things, all right? Two very quick things. When we were getting ready to move out here from California, <coughs> we were going to sell our houses, right? And the reason we didn't sell our houses is because the housing market was so horrible in North Carolina. Like, we couldn't get any return on our house. So we said, okay, we'll wait and we'll rent it out. And so from time to time, you know, people would ask us, how you doing with selling the house? And on more than one occasion, a family or a fair member's response to me when I said, oh, we're going to rent it out rather than sell it was something like this. Oh, thank you, Lord. I am so glad. I was praying that y'all would rent out y'all's house and not sell it in case y'all get all the way out there and it don't work out and you have to come back. And I'm thinking in my head, really? <laughs> really? You were praying that the new thing that God is doing in our lives would not be a part of this wonderful journey that God has us on, but rather you were praying that we would hold on to the old stuff in case we got to come back. Right? Really? And the crazy thing is, God wasn't even asking them to move to California. He was asking us. They were resistant to the change God was doing in our lives. Right? So even when it doesn't directly impact us, this change things happens. But in this story that I just share with you in this example that I just shared with you are the two things that we want to look at today. If we are going to be placing ourselves in a position to receive the new thing that God is going to do, I think that this story in this passage of scripture can help us with that. The first thing we have to be willing to do is we have to be willing to let go of what was before. We have to be willing to let go of what was before. I once saw a little boy with a balloon and he accidentally let it go. It was a helium, right? And so it is floating away, and as you can imagine, he is crying his little eyes out over this balloon that's gone, right? I mean, so much so that another little girl comes up to him and tries to give him her balloon, right? But he is so upset over that balloon that he can reach that he misses the fact that someone is trying to hand him a new one, right? things in our lives are like that? How many processes do we hold on to that no longer work? But we just want to hold on to relationships. <laughs> we know are done, but we still try to hold on to them. Right? I often hear people talk about, well, you know, 
It used to be that, you know, any adult could walk up to a kid and, um, and correct them and, you know, that child would respond respectfully because they knew that they had to get in line, right? Well, the truth of the matter is, things have changed. And things have changed because, number one, our children are not raised in that way anymore. And number two, they are not raised in communities that are as safe as they used to be. Amen? Which means that we have to what? Find a new way to communicate with our young people. Right? We have to either get to know them so that they know that we are safe and that we love them. Or we have to find a way to engage them in a way that we are not seen as a threat. Because as you just heard some of our young people say, they got to be on guard. Amen? So, instead of talking about how things used to be, why don't we just embrace a new way, right, that will work today? Isaiah 43, God says, do not remember the former things. Do not consider the things of old. For behold, I will do a new thing. Do you all find it as ironic as I do that God feels a need to preface his announcement about doing a new thing? with don't y'all start getting hung up on what you should be. He actually prefaced it. Before he even says, behold, I will do a new thing, he says, don't remember. <laughs> don't remember the old stuff. Don't consider those former things, right? Because God knows us. Now, the people that got a ring, right? In all fairness to them, swine, herding swine was probably a way of their livelihood. Right? So they were coming to the shore and they were, they pretty much they were coming to the shore to receive pink slips. Right? So their jobs are gone. So I understand why, why they were upset. The problem was their being upset, right? Only over those swine, holding on to those swine, kept them from seeing the new life that God had created in their brother. Like no one seemed to realize that something new had happened. They didn't realize it. They were hung up over those swine, which they felt like couldn't be replaced, right? If they had just taken a moment to realize what had happened, they would see that Jesus is new in this space, but he has done something that nobody else has had the capacity to do, which means that that same Jesus has the ability, right, to fill any void you feel like is left or something that's no longer there, right? Now, this is Lent, so let's put it in another perspective. There are also parts in our life, right, times in our life, where we need to assess this from another way. Swine in Jewish culture meant uncleanliness, right? And so another question becomes, what parts of our lives are unclean that we are holding on to that God wants to put something new in its place, right? Unclean. Things that we should be letting go of anyhow. Right? That we are just holding on to so tightly that we just can't let it go. Because if we refuse to let some of these things go, then we are in essence saying to God, God, I don't believe that your new thing is better than what I got. And how do you know if God's new thing is better if you haven't encountered the new thing? Right? I'm here to say that God's new thing is always better than the old thing. Right? And so we have to be willing to release what we're so familiar with, right? In order to allow space for something new, right? Now I often wonder, <coughs> in reading this passage, how the people responded to this man once he re-entered the community? Did somebody help him find a job? Right? Did somebody help him find a place to stay? Right? See, there's yet a third part to this piece. And that piece is, are we afraid of what it would look like or what, how our lives would have to change if people in our community were really healed? Come on. If those who are mentally ill and who those who are struggling with the disease of violence, right, were really healed, what would that mean? Why? Because healing is new in a place, right? Healing is newness in a place. And that means some things have to change, right? The healing of this man in gatherings costs the community something. 
Yeah. Right? They had to let go of something in order for this man to live a healed life. Yeah. Right? We talk about incarcerated men and we talk about people who are recovering from violence and people who are recovering from mental illness. But what are we willing to do after that moment of healing? Are we willing to pour into them so that they yes. can actually live a sustainable, healthy on, life? Are you, Are you ready to hire somebody? Come on, talk about Are you ready to help provide someone with a little upfront cost so that they can get an apartment? Right? So sometimes this fear is really about we know that when somebody else is coming to this space, right? That means this space is going to have to change. Amen? Yes. Amen. So if we are unwilling to let go of the things before, we need to seriously ask ourselves why. The second thing, if we're going to get a new thing from God, is we have to be willing to embrace a radically new thing. A radically new thing. So. Letting go of something in the past and embracing something new are two totally separate actions. Right? Sometimes change comes in our life and we don't have any control of it, but we can resist it. Right? Just see a new leader coming to a place, into a company, into an organization. I ain't doing that, whatever. <laughs> Because I don't know that had their swine not died, that they ever would have noticed 
the radical new life that he had brought forth in their brother. Yeah. Right? Jesus could have come, he could have healed a man, he could have left. Right. And people would have never known Jesus that came. But now all of a sudden, these swine are dead and hordes of people are at the shore hearing for the first time the name of Jesus. Ah. Mm. So if you are following Christ, I need you to hear this. If you are following Christ, I need for you not to ignore major shifts in your life. Because even though they may not be precipitated by God, I can guarantee you God is either working a new thing through that for your life or has already placed something in your life that you're ignoring that he wants you to see. Right? If we go back to Isaiah 43, what do we see? We see him say, I'm doing an animal thing here. It shall spring forth. It's going to come just like that. Right? Will you see it? Will you perceive it? Will you get it? Will you see it? Right? I will make a way in the wilderness. He said, I, I will make a clear path in the midst of your most confused places yes, in your life. Come on. I will put a river yes. in the desert. The desert is notoriously known for dry and brittle stuff. Right? He says, I am going to do a radical thing. But here's the crux. Most people look at this text and they say, oh, you know, the 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 biggest thing about this text is the fact that, you know, this man is radically healed. That is a big thing. But something that may be bigger <coughs> that we missed is the fact that Jesus traveled across the sea through a storm in order to save and heal one man. And the one man that he healed was the man most unlikely to change. Right? And he healed him so that he can help heal folk who don't know they need to be healed. Right. right? Now, so, if we are looking to be conduits of healing for people in our community, whether it's because of mental illness or violence or um, incarceration or things that they've done in their life, right? We are not conduits of healing so that we can just bless them. Right? Some of y'all got the name. Thank you. Because prayer is two-way. It's dialogue. 
right? So we don't just talk at God. Right. Yes. We talk with God. Yes. All right, now if you are not used to being in intentional silence, it's going to be awkward the first couple of times. Okay? <laughs> you sit there and you'll be like, oh my God, this could not be what you were talking about. Right? It's going to be awkward because we're not used Wait to it. being silent. On radio, on people, right? We're not used to being silent. But that silent space is inviting God to speak to you and to teach you how to hear his voice. So for the first few times, yeah, you might not hear any day. What, God? I don't know what your voice sounds like. You ask me all the time. I don't know what God sounds like. And they never actually enter the space where they say to God, I want to hear them. Right? So be consistent. Right? Be consistent. Enter that space. Have some quiet space. And eventually, I promise you, you will have an encounter with God. And God will be very clear in how God speaks to you. Alright? So now the third thing is, as it specifically relates to our message today, is you need to make sure that you have the courage to ask God where, not if, where in my life, God, am I holding on to old stuff that you said that I should never go? Where in my life, God, not if, have you brought new stuff in and new opportunities and I have rejected them because I didn't want to change? You see, some prayers we don't pray because we don't want God to answer. <laughs> this is one of them. Okay, Richard Foster says that the desire to pray is prayer. There are times where I don't feel like praying. God understands that. I'm like, I don't, I don't really feel like saying anything, but I'm here with you. You know? Right? It's okay. It's, it's not you know, like you gotta do this whole eloquent. Oh Lord, in Jesus to manifest to the Lord. Alright? So let's spend some time in prayer. Because if we are really going to be moving towards helping others to heal, we ourselves have to heal. We ourselves have to face the stuff in us that may be hindering someone else from healing. And if someone else is, is hindered from healing, then we and our community is hindered from healing. Alright? So let's enter that space. Let's take a moment in silence and bow over You are God who is able to change situations, people, and dynamics that are changing. God, we thank you that you are a God who hears us when we pray, and that you are a God who heals when we thought healing was not possible. God, we know that you have placed before us a task that sometimes seem unattainable. But God, we are reminded in this moment that we do not move by our own power or by our own might, but God, we move by the power and the anointing of your spirit. God, we are responding to your call. And God, we are asking now that you draw us closer to you individually and collectively. God, that you teach us your truth in those close spaces. God, such that we may be able to help others experience the same. God, I thank you for those who are in our midst, who are in this space today, God, for the young people who are in this place, God, who have been touched and who are experiencing pain because of the violence of this world. God, I pray for the families who need to be healed who are still grieving. God, I pray for the anger to be dispelled, Almighty God. Lord, I pray for those images to be redeemed in their mind, God, that they keep dreaming God, I pray now healing and protection over them in Jesus' name. I pray now, God, that you set a path for them so clearly, God, that you open doors for them so clearly, God, or that you give them a voice so boldly for you, Almighty God, that when they proclaim their story, others of their peers, Almighty God, will know who you are and will want to know who you are. So, God, for the young people who are in this place today, God, thank you for not just healing that they will 
be receiving here today, but God, you are going to be imparting in them a call, a call, Almighty God, to be your soldiers, God, to be your kingdom builders, God, to be those who facilitate others towards your healing. So God, I thank you that they are here. God, I thank you that they are beautiful, that they are gifted, Almighty God, that they are relevant, Almighty God, and that their voice matters in this place, Almighty God. God, I thank you for the mothers and the fathers, God, who have lost their children, God. And I even pray for the mothers and the fathers, God, of, their, of children who have taken the lives of others, God. Lord, we pray for those who are, who are bound and chained, almighty God, to death right now. God, we pray for those who are chained in the tombs, God, Lord, that you will free them from the mind of violence and pain and anger. God, that you will heal them even as you heal us. God, allow no part of these circumstances to go untouched, God. Lord, we pray for perpetual peace, not just in our communities and our families, God, but in this nation and in this world. God, may the power of your righteousness and your holiness, the power of your spirit, move in us that we might not be complacent or that we might not ignore your voice but God may we hear you and may we always invite you in Jesus name Amen, Amen.